And so I would like to, again, welcome everybody um, to this presentation. It's uh, Howard Heffler will be speaking on Newfoundland, birds and more. Uh, so in June 2022, Howard and Lynn Heffler visited Newfoundland for 18 days. And although their primary focus was birding, specifically seabirds, uh, they also wanted to more, uh, learn more about the history of Canada's youngest province. And interestingly, one with the oldest European settlements. There are several easily accessible seabird colonies with millions of nesting birds. They joined a three-day birding tour of the Avalon Peninsula and explored the rest of the island on their own. So we would like to, uh, I won't tell you any more because Howard will go into all the details, but Howard has been a member for over 20 years. He has participated in many field trips and has um, been a field trip um, coordinator. He, uh, he's a retired engineer and with a 45 year a career in pollution control and environmental management. So without further ado, I'm gonna stop my sharing and hand it over to Howard. All right, let's see if I can find. I, thanks, Kaya. And uh, good evening, everyone. I have to get that window out of the way so I can now start this up. And there we go. Oops, hold still. And now, um, yeah, thanks, Kaya. I have a couple of things that are blocking my view and they're perhaps blocking your view. So I'll let you drag them out of the way. Um, yeah, thanks, Kaya. Uh, good evening, everyone. And uh, happy to do this. Um, I noticed before I moved that out of the way, there's quite a glow off my forehead. So I suggest that uh, you try and drag that video image out of the way so you're not blinded by the light. Um, Lynn and I are in Ottawa at the moment. Um, so it's nine o'clock here. Uh, I'm in the, the grandkids' playrooms, hence the pictures on the wall behind me. And I kind of lock myself in and hope we're not disturbed for the next little while. Um, I'd, I'd like to begin with a, a land acknowledgement. And, uh, but first, uh, just a couple words to describe the history of Indigenous people of Newfoundland. And to get this right, I'm going to be as careful as I can in reading a few notes I made. The province of Newfoundland and Labrador today is home to four peoples of Indigenous ancestry, the Inuit, the Innu, the Mi'kmaq, and the Southern Inuit. The Inuit and the Innu are descendants of the Thule people who migrated to Labrador from the Canadian Arctic seven to 800 years ago. The Southern Inuit are descendants of European and native peoples of Labrador. The Mi'kmaq are found on the island of Newfoundland. They're descended from Algonquin hunter-gatherers whose homeland included what is now Nova Scotia, Prince Edward Island, and New Brunswick. The Biosic were the indigenous inhabitants of the island of Newfoundland. They were Algonquin-speaking hunter-gatherers hunter who occupied most of the island. The Biotic became extinct in 1829. So I'd like to acknowledge the land that Lynn and I visited. We're only visitors to Newfoundland, but I still feel that by reciting a land acknowledgement, we're making a small step in the reconciliation process. So I found and did a little editing on a land acknowledgement for the St. John's campus of Memorial University. We respectfully acknowledge the territory which we visited as the ancestral homelands of the Beothic and of the Mi'kmaq. We had also and my slides are not advancing here. Um, yeah, sorry. Uh, it respectfully acknowledge that the uh, lands of the Mi'kmaq 
also recognize the Inuit and the Innu and their ancestors as the original people of Labrador. We should all strive for respectful relationships with all indigenous people of this and every province as we search for collective healing and truth. So um, I'm going to, first I'm gonna try and drag this out of the way so I can see better. Uh, so uh, as Kaya said, we were in Newfoundland for almost three weeks, uh, or first part of June, uh, mostly on our own. Uh, we joined a three-day uh, tour with Jared Clark. Jared is a, a bird guide in Newfoundland. Then there is Whole Life, uh, calls himself Bird the Rock. You can look on his website, uh, June 2nd to 4th. And, you know, we were primarily interested in seeing uh, seabirds. Uh, and then we traveled across the rest of uh, Newfoundland uh, on our own for both birds and tourism. And I'm having a problem advancing my slides here. There we go. So I'm gonna try to describe just a few hot spots, not cover everywhere we went by any means. Uh, primarily Avalon Peninsula, which is where we were with Jared and uh, a few things about the rest of the province. And so I'd, I'd like to also just say a little bit about geology um, mm. as we go along. And um, in St. John's, the Johnson Geo Center describes the geological features of Newfoundland really well. And there are a number of things that are quite unique and geologically important. Um, and I'll try to remember to mention some of those um, and while I see it on the screen, the one other thing I'll just mention now, the Provincial Museum in St. John's, I don't know the origin of the name, the rooms, but it, it really is well done. So uh, just two highlights I wanted to mention now that I, I may forget later as we're moving along. Uh, so on uh, Avalon Peninsula, St. John's itself, um, Britless Bay, Cape St. Mary's, and Cape Bonavista. So my cousins, uh, oh, I should mention this too. Um, we tried to eBird most of the places that we stopped. And I don't know if you use eBird trip reports. It's a relatively new feature. Um, you can define a trip report by picking the beginning date of a checklist and the end. So if you have a series of checklists from a particular trip, you select the first and the last. Uh, eBird will compile them into a very nice uh, summary of uh, with a map showing the locations, a uh, list of the species, a list of lifers, and you can go to each individual checklist. And uh, that's a very handy tool. Um, so I'll mention a, a couple of spots that we visited uh, around St. John's. Uh, Cape Spear Lighthouse National Historic Site is uh, the most easterly point of, new, new, of North America. And Signal Hill, of course, another famous spot. We birded at these. Um, and uh, my cousin's husband is from St. John's and his brother, Frank King, is still there. He's a birder uh, and a photographer. And he's good enough to take us around, Lynn and I, for the first couple of days. Uh, one of the spots we went was uh, a hot spot right on the campus of Memorial University for a pink-footed goose. Uh, so we visited quite a few spots in the St. John's area. And then uh, Frank took us for the pink-footed goose, which we missed. But the next day, Lynn and I found it, him, it, on uh, the lawn, right where it was supposed to be. Apparently, it's been there for a couple of years. Um, the legend is that it came by ship and uh, it just stayed. So uh, uh, pink-footed goose, the two um, primary populations, uh, one from Greenland and Iceland and the other from Norway. Uh, but if you look at the eBird distribution, you can see that it's not too uncommon in North America. And many folks uh, have chased it around to get it on their ABA list. So uh, now that wasn't really one of our target birds, but we couldn't help it go after that. Uh, so 
first spot I want to take you to is Whitless Bay, not that far from St. John's. So we're in the van, Jared picked everybody up and uh, it was cold and it was raining and it was blowing and we stopped at three or four spots and it was, um, well, the others saw some birds and heard some birds, but it, I, I couldn't hear a thing and, and my glasses were all fogged up. So uh, it was not the best start, but we got to Whitless Bay and uh, the weather wasn't wasn't bad. We took off all our wet stuff and put on a little bit warmer clothes. Um, so there's a tour boat that takes people out um, to the ecological reserve. And if you take a look, you can see the, the small harbor um, and uh, the weather doesn't look too bad. Whitless Bay is an ecological reserve, uh, consists of four islands. There's a immense numbers of nesting birds that nest on these islands. Um, as the largest North American colony of Atlantic puffin, as estimated that 250,000 pairs of puffin nest there each year. Um, second largest colony of leeches storm petrels, um, 600,000 pairs of, of leeches storm petrel nest there each year. Thousands of black-legged kittiwakes and common mirrors, so lots of birds. Um, so off we go. Um, the weather was good enough that we could stay on the upper deck for the entire cruise, which if I remember was a couple of hours, two or three hours. Um, can't land on any of the islands, but you certainly go close enough to um, get some good looks and some good pictures. Um, so the first bird I mentioned is a common mirror. Again, a circumpolar distribution. And um, we put uh, 200,000 on the list that day. Um, and as you get closer, you start to see lots of common mirrors, also called common guillemot in uh, Europe. Um, large numbers of this bird. But, um, they estimate 5 million pairs in the North Pacific region and 3 million in the Atlantic region. Uh, these birds eggs hatch after 30 days and another 20 days and kick leaves this little ledge. Uh, they are still flightless and so they leap or maybe they're pushed uh, off the cliff and sputter towards the sea. Off they go with the male parent um, and they don't come back to land until they reach breeding age in, in a few years. So a pelagic bird but nesting on these mostly on islands where they're safe from terrestrial predators. So just to demonstrate, there are lots of them. And close enough to the boat that you can get a few pictures. And uh, and this is a, a one thing I read and uh, is that they have the smallest territory of any bird, uh, less than a square foot. So I, I guess there's the some truth to that. You can see how tightly wedged in there. I looked through my pictures to try and find an egg. The egg apparently is a little bit eccentric in shape so that when it might roll around on the ledge, it kind of rolls in a circle and it's less likely to fall off. Now I think, I think that's an egg. I'm not going to guarantee it, but it looks like an egg to me. Um, thick bill mirror, uh, not nearly that many uh, here. Uh, Jared managed to pick out one. Uh, you can see it has a darker head, but most prominently has a white gate stripe or uh, lipstick. Um, they are more northerly in their distribution, um, but a very similar lifestyle. So, uh, oh, I threw this in here at the last moment. Uh, my cursor will find it. There we go. This is also a common year. But you can see the white eye ring and a little bit of a white stripe going behind the eye. That's a common mirror. I think is somewhere on 5% uh, have that facial pattern and they are named uh, bridal common mirror. So here we have a common mirror having a conversation with the uh, razor bill. Um, there's fewer of, the, fewer of them. We put 60 on the checklist that day. Um, also a colonial nesting seabird. 
on these rocky ledges. Um, not quite as precipitous in choosing a ledge. It tries to find something that's a little bit more uh, protective, I guess. Um, so the razor bill again, North Atlantic distribution, and uh, these shellers are relatively common and not that hard from the boat to get a few pictures of them. Um, nice picture of a black guillemot, uh, dramatic summer plumage of a very solid black with that white patch on the side. And you'll see the red legs and inside the moat, brilliant red. Um, they're more commonly seen than some of these other birds. They're, they nest um, or their habitat is closer to shore and uh, you'll see them quite often from other locations as well around the, the coast. Oh, I should also, I'm sure some of you have been to the West Coast and seen the pigeon guillemot on the Northwest coast of British Columbia. Uh, I have to, of course, mention puffins. They seem to, nest, they do nest in burrows at the top. So everybody has a, a little niche there. And apparently uh, the penguin or the, the uh, puffins uh, like the top and will create these nesting burrows. Uh, we put down 5,000 on the list of this location now. And uh, it, I don't have to tell you what they look like. Uh, they're funny looking little guys. They have nicknames like the clown bird. Um, it's a provincial bird of Newfoundland. Um, and they're on the water feeding and trying to get a picture of uh, the iconic shot of a puffin with the 10 or 12 little fish in its mouth. I think this bird has one or maybe two. That's the best I could do. And they take off running across the water. And when they land, they sometimes seem to make crash landings. Now they're cute little guys. I'll say a bit more about them. Um, when we get to uh, Cape Bonavista, black-legged kittiwakes. Um, we put down 10,000 on the list uh, on this location. Um, if you remember a couple of years ago, there's a black-legged kittiwake at the Pagan Ponds there in Calgary. And so my life list for black-legged kittiwake went from one to 10,000 in a period of about 10 minutes. So uh, this was a probably a highlight or one of the key highlights in the entire trip. Um, we left Whitless Bay, we're driving in the van and Jared out of the corner of eyes saw something and drove into a, a bay um, right beside a fish plant. And there were 200, 250 leeches storm petrels. And this is not a bird that's easy to see. Um, very pelagic bird, it's a small tube nose like the albatross or shearwaters. And when I say small, um, they say robin size, uh, but it looks even daintier than a robin to me. Uh, and it, it's not an easy bird to see from shore. They're a pelagic bird. Uh, they do nest in burrows or rocky ledges. Uh, typically on cliffs or islands where they're safe from terrestrial predators, but they're also nocturnal. So they don't return to their nesting burrow until after dark and, and leave before daylight. So not an easy bird to see. Um, occasionally during a storm, you'll see one or two uh, from shore. And then sometimes with a storm or perhaps attracted by coastal lighting, they're attracted and and land and seem confused on shore overnight and people will uh, gather them up and try and release them back to sea. But to see 200 of them in calm water uh, so close um, was something Jared had never experienced himself. So it was a real treat to see this. The um, first part of the scientific name for Leech's storm petrel is Hydrobates, which is 
hydro for water and Beatty's for water walker, so water walker. Um, and the name petrol may be derived from Peter, like St. Peter, for its behavior to apparent, appear to be walking on water. So they fly uh, and, and hover, flutter over the water, picking little things from the surface. And to have a chance to take them, we actually got some videos with the handheld iPhone. So it's just a real special opportunity here. Um, I don't know if any of you follow occasionally the podcast called Warblers, but one of the recent editions on, on, on the uh, Warbler podcast was a science lady who has been studying leeches storm petrels for, for a long time. Excellent presentation, really very interesting. So that certainly looks as if that bird is walking on water. Okay, our next, or not exactly our next stop, but the next stop that I wanted to describe was uh, Avon Peninsula, and the Avon Peninsula was Cape St. Mary's. Um, so it's uh, um, sort of on the bottom left-hand corner of the Avalon Peninsula, and there's a lighthouse, of course, and so the band is parked up in the corner there. There's the rest of the group hanging their feet sort of over the edge. And as you walk along, you're coming to these coastal sea cliffs with all of these nesting. In this case, the predominant bird was um, a northern gannet. So I'll have a couple pictures of me standing well back from the edge so it's just to set the stage. I'm not really great at heights here. So as we walked out, there's a few gannets gathering nesting material. And then as you get close, you begin to see just how many birds there are. Let me just make a note. I think we put down 20,000 uh, um, on the eBird checklist. So here's a perfect viewing spot. The birds don't seem disturbed at all. And uh, there's kind of a rocky column close into that point. And so you could spend, we did spend two or three hours there. Um, and you can see the density of these birds. There's, uh, there's black lady kittiwakes and common ears and uh, uh, razorbill as well. But certainly the most common bird here was the northern gannet. So bringing in nesting materials, they build a bit of a nest, you can see. Um, a little bit more than the mirrors seem to just be on the rocky ledge. Very attractive bird. We've seen them in um, Australia and in New Zealand. And to me, they look the same, but I checked and there are uh, two species in the Southern Oceans. Um, and their names are <laughs> Cape and Australasian gannets. They look the same to me. Eh? So um, Cape Bonavista, a little town of Elliston, and uh, believe me, the theme here is puffins. Um, I think they have a puffin festival, and I hope you can see in the picture, these are lawn chairs that are designed uh, to look like puffins, and they had a couple on the roof of the, the uh, uh, interpretive center there. So uh, there's puffins, and this is probably the easiest and most popular place to see puffin. Uh, North Atlantic distribution um, on the west coast of the Pacific. Um, there's also tufted puffin and horned puffin, but the Atlantic puffin here, both sides of the Atlantic. And uh, you walk for about a kilometer out and there's uh, easy viewing across a little gap to a rocky island and there's lots of the birds here. I'm not quite sure how many we put down on this location uh, but there's again this is a big colony 
and you could spend forever taking pictures of these guys and and they always seem to be looking confused or looking around or I had this picture here and and I've looked at it a number of times trying to think of a caption and so I'll, I'll invite you to dream up a caption and if you want to put it in the chat room uh, but to me that bird looks to have its hands on its hips or its wings on its hips looking in to its mate inside the burrow. And the best I could come up with is, uh, I'm going fishing, can I bring you something? So you maybe you wanna enter a little caption for that picture in the chat room. So uh, this was probably A or maybe Z, classic birding story by Roger Torrey Peterson and his friend James Fisher. Um, I'm sure many, if not, all of you have read this book. Um, 1953, Roger Torrey Peterson met his friend James Fisher, um, and certainly the, their adventure began in Newfoundland for the seabirds. Um, the story of them getting out to um, Cape St. Mary's, uh, they had a lot more challenges than we did uh, this summer, believe me. Terrific story. Uh, the two of them started in Newfoundland, uh, spent 100 days touring 30,000 miles across America, saw 572 species. Um, and of course, this trip has been repeated probably by many others in the past. And it's also reputed to be sort of the beginning of the idea of doing a big year. So I'm sure some of you would have recalled this book last year, Lynn Hancock wrote a book looking looking for the wild. And this is a trip that Gus Yaki did, well, I think 30, day, 30 years to the day, began in Newfoundland and did his best to follow the identical path to Roger Torrey Peterson's uh, Wild America trip. If you remember, Lynn Hancock presented uh, last year for Bird Study Group, um, kind of in tribute to Gus and uh, the trip that he had made. Roger Torrey Peterson joined Gus's trip for a few days. Um, just take a look at the bottom of the forward and this book was written by Roger Torrey Peterson and illustrated by uh, Robert Bateman. So uh, again, a really interesting story. Um, just a few other bird stories before we move to tourism. Um, I'll say a little bit about gulls. We did see willow ptarmigan. Uh, a couple of distant birds um, couldn't really get a photograph. Um, there's warblers there in breeding season. I think we had 14 on our combined eBird list, similar to the warblers that we would see here, perhaps a bit different distribution. Uh, magnolia warbler, black throated green warblers were, were more common there than we would see in Calgary area anyway. Uh, Sparrows, the Savannah sparrow is probably the most common sparrow we saw, but fox sparrows and swamp sparrows seem quite a bit more common than, than we see them in Alberta. Uh, here's the uh, black legged kittiwakes again. Um, and they nest again on the rocky ledges in with the other seabirds. They build a little bit of a nest. Nice looking gull, actually. If you remember the one that was at Peg and Ponds. Uh, the other gulls, ringbill gulls, common. Uh, herring gull, I think, is the most common. Uh, great black black gull is quite common. A huge, huge bird. I really hoped to see a black headed gull in the bright bloomy breeding plumage. Um, we did see this just about on the last day we were there in a small pond in St. John's. Um, on the same pond was a northern shoveler. So I had uh, looked, of course, on eBird for rare bird lists, uh, rare bird reports, and signed on to the WhatsApp group for rare birds in, in Newfoundland. And a rare bird was a northern shoveler. And uh, so on the same pond, on the same day, was a black duck, American black duck. Uh, so 
Here's an example of a rare bird that's sort of very common to us and a bird that we would almost never see in Alberta that's very common there. So it just shows that uh, when you're traveling somewhere new, uh, you're going to see a different mix of birds. Uh, <clears throat> Magnolia warbler, black throated green. Uh, as I said, seem to be a lot of fox sparrows. You hear them more or less everywhere. Um, big sparrow, we see them here, of course, but uh, they're not nearly as common. Uh, swamp sparrow in the right habitat, very common, but they flit around and very. we only saw, saw them occasionally. And finally, I managed to get a photograph of one stayed still long enough. So um, I thought we'd do a bit of tourism now. Um, so we went across the province from St. John's. Uh, another strategy would be to drive one way from St. John's to Deer Lake and return home from there. Uh, the one way drop charge on a rental car is really prohibitive. So unless you're part of a tour group, that may not be a, a feasible way. Um, I guess I should add that um, if I've run into a number of people over the last few months who say, I, I want to go to Newfoundland, how was it? Uh, so if I can provide any more information, just give me a show that I'm happy to tell you um, as much or perhaps even more than you want to know about St. John, about Newfoundland. Um, so Gross Morns, obviously on the west side of National Park and all the way up to the top left-hand corner uh, to St. Anthony. Uh, just so that I don't forget, uh, mistaken point, I'll show you a photo of that. Um, in fact, I think, Oh yeah, I should say that we put it quite a few miles on the rental car, um, 3,000 kilometers actually. And so we did quite a bit of this. And the roads are pretty good actually, uh, most part. And of course we did some of this. The price of gas at that time in other parts of Canada was $2 or close to it. So this is not too outrageous. Uh, we did a bit of this. But as often as we could, we had our lunch in the back of the, go to the back of the car, just bought groceries and, and they did it that way. Uh, it's a little hard to tell. This is the, not the most attractive spot we've ever stopped for a picnic, some kind of gravel pit, a uh, barrel pit beside the highway. Um, I'm sure this has happened to you. You stop in an ugly spot and then five minutes later, you come to a beautiful picnic table. So anyway, we did our best to, to make your own sandwiches. Uh, so this is Mistaken Point, um, a very important World Heritage Site, uh, fossil site, uh, in the same importance as the Burgess Shales, uh, 556 million years age. Um, and uh, these multicellular animals are some of, if not the oldest, fossils that have been found. And I, I wish I could remember more about geology. I read or listen to a lecture and, and a few minutes later, I think that was really interesting. And, and an hour later, I can't remember a lot about it. Um, the rocks in this area match with Morocco and uh, with, with rock in Morocco. And this is one of the early things to confirm tectonic plate theory. So a lot of interesting geology there. Oh, I should notice too, you take a look, everybody's in sock feet. So you hike out about three kilometers to this fossil bed, and then they have demonstrated that walking on this rock with your boots would damage the rock and the fossils. So uh, you have to take your boots off and walk in your sock feet. That's what the fossils look like embedded in the rock. Oh, I just wanted to show a quick picture if you do go to Elliston for the Puffins, really go into this uh, ceiling museum. The historic footage, of uh, movie footage of uh, the men getting off ships and going out onto the moving ice hunting seals, it just shows a really tough life. And the story goes right up to the modern day, so well worth a visit. Oh, and um, John Cabot, if you remember from your history, sailed on his ship from England, the ship Matthew in uh, 1497. 
from his journals, he made landfall somewhere in uh, the Cape Bonavista area is determined. I don't think they know really where exactly. Uh, this was one of the monuments to uh, John Cabot's landfall. And while we were there, uh, herring gull made landfall as well. My picture of a herring gull. Uh, Grossmore National Park, again, an iconic scene of Newfoundland. Um, the southern unit, I believe we call it Tablelands. And um, well, I forgot to mention when I mentioned willow ptarmigan, there are rock ptarmigan in Grossmore National Park. A uh, long hike, eight or 12 hour hike to a mountain. It's actually closed during uh, breeding season of the birds. Uh, we did not even come close to doing that, but rock ptarmigan are found in Grossmore or Western Newfoundland. So uh, we took the tour boat. We were fortunate to have a blue sky day, calm water, and uh, 200 of our closest friends joined us. And uh, I don't have to say more than let the scenery speak for itself, just dramatic uh, landforms here, huge uh, cliffs. And uh, this was geologically a fjord, which technically is no longer a fjord because it's landlocked and has over time become replaced with freshwater. Apparently, fjords are only saltwater. But uh, the tour boat takes you up to the head of what's called West Brook Pond. Uh, those of you that have been there know that the word pond in Newfoundland can mean a pretty good size body or a lake. So all the way to St. Anthony, um, I, I made some notes here. I wanna make sure I get this correct here. Um, so I grew up in Nova Scotia. I heard about the Grenville mission, um, but I didn't really know what it was. So while they're in their museum, uh, this is the home of the doctors uh, at the Grenville mission, but the Grenville mission was started by Sir Wilfred Grenville, who as a young doctor, medical missionary, was sent by the Royal National Mission of Deep Sea Fishermen to Newfoundland and Labrador in 1892 to improve the plight of coastal inhabitants and fishermen. So in the museum reading the history, it's apparent that the health and living conditions in this area in Labrador coast was just appalling at that time. So over the years, he, he, he didn't come for one or two years. He presumably fell in love with it, devoted his life to this. They recruited doctors and nurses, established oak buildings, uh, traveled the, the world and raised millions of dollars uh, for the mission. Uh, over time was honored by both Canadian and US governments um, and knighted by the King in 1927. So Grenville Mission, up until modern times, I think in the 50s, provided health services for this part of Newfoundland, and even still have a foundation that provides scholarships to young people. Um, so it's unfortunate that Anne Melton didn't make it home in time for the show tonight. Uh, she worked there in St. Anthony as a nurse, and she asked me to take pictures of the co-op uh, and this is, I asked the lady at the information place, which is the co-op. So I took this picture for Anne. It's now a pub. And Anne asked me to take a picture of the hospital where she worked. Um, I don't know if this extension was when, after Anne had been there or while she was there, but there's the old unit and the new unit. So unfortunately, Anne will have to tell you about her time um, in St. Anthony. Uh, at the next meeting. Uh, she did tell me briefly, like when she was there, you had to fly in, there was no road, et cetera. So very different time. Um, really the, one of the key reasons we went to Newfoundland, I was just intrigued by this um, early Viking archeological site managed by Parks Canada called Lanso Meadows. Um, it's a national historic site, a UNESCO World Heritage Site, um, the archaeological site from the 11th century of Viking settlement, uh, earliest evidence of Europeans in North America. So that's 1000 AD 
which is four or 500 years before Columbus. Um, so there's an excellent interpretive center when you arrive and then they have, I guess the word is built or rebuilt these replicas of the um, wood framed peat turf buildings that were originally here a thousand years ago and uh, very similar to those that are found in uh, Greenland and Iceland. So just very, and inside the buildings they have actors and artifacts to tell the story. So really well worthwhile. Um, it's the only known site of a settlement by the Vikings in North America. Now they, they spent 10 years here and I can recall hearing the terms Markland and Vinland. So Markland would be like forested areas. So they would have visited, this area was not forested. Uh, say Labrador, where it would have been forested, and then Vinland, which is wine, and there were grapes at that time in New Brunswick. So apparently they traveled as far as New Brunswick, but no archaeological evidence of any um, other sites have been found yet. So that's it for tourism. I'm just going to close with a couple of funny pictures here. Um, it's a windy place. Uh, it's hard to take a picture of wind. Um, this is obviously some wind pruned trees. Um, there are studies going on to look into building wind farms for renewable power, renewable power generation. Um, and uh, another picture to illustrate this was a, an outhouse has reinforced against the wind with the three, I guess there's three six inch logs. Now I, I'm going to admit that if you were in the outhouse and it blew over, uh, that that's a significant event. So, but if you have to use six-inch logs to reinforce it, I don't think you need a lot of scientific study to know that it must be a pretty windy place. Oh, and I forgot when we were in the Avalon Peninsula to mention caribou. We saw I think a total of 19 caribou during the trip. Um, in Avalon Peninsula, there's what's called a subarctic tundra, very interesting landform. And, uh, and then also in Western Newfoundland, we saw, I think it added up to a total of 19 caribou. Of course, you all know that there's moose there. They were introduced 100 years ago and have become almost a plague. So we knew we'd see moose and I was sure I'd get pictures of moose, but I think we only saw three. And, and finally, I got a picture of one moose. It's the best I could do. And St. John's, uh, of course, the colored houses, uh, again, an iconic photo. I don't know how they get the photos without the wires and the cars in front of the house, but uh, the same theme you can find elsewhere around the island. People like that this is at a motel and the people had painted the rocks in the same concept. Um, icebergs, um, there's an app for people to around and find icebergs. We only saw a, a few, two or three up in the St. Anthony area. There were others uh, elsewhere, but uh, I had to have one pitch of a, of a thing. Now I'm gonna have to try something here. Bear with me for a moment. I'm just blocking my view. So um, I'm not sure if you can see it, it's hidden from my view, but um, I just ask you, you know, as Kai has said, if you have any questions, or just um, throw them in the chat room. Um, next, while we were there in Saint, in Newfoundland, we did talk about the risk of avian flu, and uh, there was no reports of it at that time. But since then, I have seen one or two reports, and it's a really sad story. And uh, so next month we'll learn more about that. But the seabird colonies are obviously very vulnerable to uh, avian flu. And I uh, hope this will work. I'll just switch it back to Kaya here and uh, hopefully this will show just a couple of videos. I hope, click. And there we go. So these are the common mirrors.
and leaches current petrol. And I'll let uh, Kaya take control again. Well, thanks very much, Howard. I uh, really appreciate uh, you putting all that together and sharing it with us. Um, I think you're still on mute. <laughs> Am I still on mute? Is everything okay? Can you hear me? I can hear you. Okay. Uh, so if there's any questions, uh, you can either unmute yourself or you can uh, put them in the chat. Uh, so far, everybody's been pretty quiet, but uh, you've got some compliments on your photography and presentation. So again, thank you so much. Sounds like it was quite a trip. Is there any place that you wanted to go that you didn't quite hit or there? Uh, yeah, I, actually, for some reason, I had my speaker turned off for just a minute. So I just heard the last part of that, Kaya. So, as I said, we went 3,000 kilometers and we saw quite a few things that I didn't have uh, include in the talk. So uh, if anybody has questions or wants more details, just give me, give me a shout. However, there are things we did not see for sure. And it would have been nice to get down to Port of Basque. Um, and of course, we all read about in the hurricane uh, that just hit there. Uh, tremendous damage there, but it would be nice to have been there to put that in a bit of context. And then there's a wooden ship museum that I really wanted to see, but it was closed when we went past. So uh, maybe we'll have to go again. Well, it sounds like a fantastic trip. So uh, where did you, uh, if you had to do a, like if somebody went and they only had a couple of days, are there places where you would suggest them going um, or, or doing versus uh, others, are there? Yeah, it, it, it's a shame to have to go out for only a couple of days. Um, for, in terms of birds for folks from Calgary, from Alberta, um, I think the seabirds are the thing of interest. Um, Nimely, oh, I see Nimely's name there. Nimely was there at the same time we were actually, and she toured across the province. She might want to add something. Um, with the birding tour. Um, but my feeling is the Avalon Peninsula and Cape Bonavista is where you're going to see the birds, the alcids, those birds that we just don't see in Alberta. Um, but, you know, honestly, there's a lot to see there. So if you have two or three days, St. John's, go to the Rooms Museum, go to the Johnson Geoscience Center, and go to all of our seabird colonies. Excellent. So we do have some questions now, and uh, one of them is, what camera did you use for the still photos? Oh, um, that's a good question. Um, I forget. Uh, what I mean by that is I bought a new camera, and I can't honestly remember whether I bought it before or after. Somebody <laughs> may have to help me. So. Uh, I see John Anderson's name there. He has the same camera and it's Olympus OM-1 and I have a 300 millimeter prime lens. I'm quite sure that's what I had on that trip. So uh, yeah, and uh, it's a mirrorless uh, four thirds format. Um, if you want more details, maybe you should ask Andrew Hart. He knows more about it than I do. All right. And I think Marcia has a question. Oh, her hand went down. So uh, Andrew Hart is wondering, uh, not including the bird tour, did you see many people out birding? Um, no, uh, but there were lots there. So I know Nimely was there uh, with a bird tour organized by Abbasset. Um, immediately after we finished with Jared, he began an 11 day tour with, uh, I think, Eagle Eye. And he's assisted by um, Joseph, who a lot of you folks in Calgary know Joseph. Um, and they had so many people on that trip that they ran a second trip 
with uh, who is guiding that, Jody Allaire. And uh, no, I'm not sure I'm right on that. Um, so there is at least three other tours at the same time we were there. And they went, I think they all go St. John's to the Avalon Peninsula, and then one way trip across to Deer Lake. Um, and the participants fly home from there. Um, while I was there with our friend Frank King, I could see a little bit about the birding community there. It's pretty active. They have a WhatsApp group for rare bird reports like we do. Um, you take a look at eBird, there's lots of posting. Um, my feeling is this is the time of year, or that was the time of year to go for what we wanted to see. But also the other thing in Newfoundland is uh, rare birds. So in the wintertime, there's a lot of uh, rarities that are blown in. And um, actually, I just happened to see today that Jared is running a winter trip for, I think, just last, uh, that's in January. January in Newfoundland. A <laughs> little bit chilly. <laughs> yeah. It might be good for birding, but it's not good for birders. <laughs> yeah. Well, we're tough people out here too, so. Mm. All right. Well, I think uh, that's all the questions that we have so far. So thank you again. We really appreciate you. Um, and uh, we appreciate uh, you putting this together for us. So if anybody has any questions for Howard, um, you can either reach out to Nature Calgary and we'll put you in touch. Or uh, I know every once in a while he does some, still does some field trips with us. So you can, uh, you can find him uh, on that and, and pepper him with questions. So. All right, I will say good night to everybody then. And uh, yeah, we really appreciate everything.